Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again. In this video, I want to continue on talking about some of the key terminology and ideas within the ecological approach to skill acquisition. In this video, I want to focus on the idea of information and contrast what we mean by the different types of information and the difference between an information source and a cue. Then I want to focus on a little bit about the issue of specification, what we mean by a specifying information source. And finally, I'll touch a little bit on how we think learning occurs within the uh, ecological approach. What exactly happens when we learn and we get better at a new skill? So just like the other videos, this is building on kind of the groundwork I laid in that the very first video bill where I was contrasting the two different approaches to skill acquisition, the information processing approach and ecological approach. So that's going to build on this again. I'm going to talk about uh, the two different approaches. So the task I want to look at today, what I want to focus on to use is kind of the paradigm for understanding uh, these, how we, this information and these topics is the task of breaking to avoid a collision. So imagine you're driving in your car, you're going along the road at a certain speed, up ahead you see a stop sign or something else in the road and you need to brake, right? So we have a control problem. We have a perception action control problem. We need to somehow use visual information to learn things like, how do I know when to start braking? How much brake sh pressure should I apply? When should I apply it, so, right? So we have a goal of trying to stop at that stop sign. We don't want and we don't want to just achieve it any old way, right? We don't want to slam on the brakes and stop way in front of the stop sign. And we don't want to stop too late so that we go through it, right? So we have a very specific goal in mind. Let's look at how the two different uh, approaches to skill acquisition and con action control might think about this, this problem, okay? So the first one is from the information processing approach. And this is the idea that we have an internal model in our head, right? So we're going to use information. And within our head, we have this kind of multi-purpose 3D model of the world, right? We can use to calculate the positions and movements of objects in the world in order to make predictions about what's going to happen and control our actions, right? And so within this model-based approach, this key assumptions are that, right, what we need are the variables that we would use to describe this problem in physics. Right? We need to, if we're moving towards an object when we're driving our car, right, we need to know the distance. We need to know the velocity we're traveling. And from that, we can, we can compute things, right? And we can make predictions. How much time do I have left, right? In our in the classic V equals D over T kind of things you did in physics class in high school, right? So that's the start. We, the world, we understand the world the same way a physicist does, right? That's the way you process the world. The key thing in, in the information processing view is that we don't have access to these variables, right? Your eye cannot calculate distance directly. We don't have a speedometer in our head, right? We don't know how fast we're going. We could look down at our one on the, in the car, but imagine we didn't have one, right? So we need to compute these. We need to calculate them in our head. So what we're going to take in are um, non-specifying cues. So we're going to take information from our eye that is a cue because it kind of hints at what we need, but it's not all we need, right? We need to do the processing, the, the calculations, right? We need to process the visual inputs. So for example, we might take in a bunch of visual cues, like the angular size of an object, how big of an image it forms on the retina, its height in plane, right? How high a relative is it is to the horizon, those are cues we can use to judge its things like depth and distance, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. The optic flow rate, how fast things along the road edge are flying by us, tells us about a speed, our speed, right? And so we have all these ones that we can use and bring into our internal model. And each of these, and I'll show in a second, is non-specifying, right? It doesn't tell us what we need to know, right? We need to do some calculations. Even if we just know the distance to the stop sign, Right? We still need to know how fast we're going to know how hard we're break, we have to break, right? So we take in these cues to our internal model and we do some computation and processing of them. We likely, in the information processing view, we bring in some memory, right? We have knowledge from past experiences. Maybe we've been in this breaking scenarios before. We recall what we did before. We compute, we calculate, we process, and we get this output of the required deceleration. Right, which is there's a little formula there. You know, for example, we could use. 
v squared equals two over z, right? There's a little formula. That's that's a required re deceleration we need to avoid colliding with that stop sign. We then output this from our processing centers in our brain, our internal model, to the motor control areas, right? We say, okay, we know what we need to do. Here is the, put this into our motor program for braking, stepping on the pedal, and then we generate a foot movement on the pedal, an open loop one. By that, I mean, we just start it and it runs on its own, right? We don't control it online. We don't adjust it. We just, we have it run on its own. So this is an example of what we call indirect perception, right? The variables we're taking in are in, we, they're not giving us what we need. They're not telling us what we need to break successfully. We need to calculate them. We need to elaborate on them. We need to add to them from our memory and other things. And it's an example of predictive control. What we're trying to do from the visual information we're taking in and the cues is predict, right? Predict how long we have before we're gonna hit the stop sign how much time we have. So this is in indirect perception and predictive control. Why are these information sources non-specifying? Let's give an example of what we mean by that in more detail, right? So non-specifying, what that means is that the information source of the queue cannot be used on its own to achieve our goal, right? It requires some further elaboration or processing. So let's give an example. Let's look at the example of the angular size of an object. So imagine I have a person standing in the middle of the road. The guy with the hat is standing in the road, right? I'm driving along. They're, they're, the angular size, the, the size they form on my retina, right, is related to their distance, right? The closer they are, the bigger that angle theta is going to be. The further away they are, the smaller it will be. So theta, that angular, angular size, is related to distance, right? So it's useful information. But it's not specifying for a couple reasons. One reason is, right, I need to know more than just distance because I need to know my speed to know how to brake properly. Another problem is one that people have actually tried to put forth as a cause of accidents, right? Because that angular, same angular size could be made by that man in the hat far away or by a child much closer running on the street, right? They form the same angular size. So angular size alone in this example is ambiguous, right? It's non-specifying. It doesn't give me what I need to break successfully. I need to elaborate on them. In the information processing approach, this elaboration, for example, might involve recognizing what kind of person it is, recognizing whether it's an adult or a child, doing some adjustment to my model based on, on that information, and then adjusting my braking, right? So non-specifying information is information that is not sufficient to be able to achieve my goals, to control my actions. It requires some processing calculations. It's ambiguous on its own, right? And in the indirect perception approach, in the information processing approach, it's thought that all information is like this. Right? All information in the world is uh, non-specifying. We can't achieve our actions without elaboration and processing because the information coming in is impoverished, it's ambiguous, it's not good enough. That's the whole, right, the foundation, the root of the tree in the information processing approach. So we need to do this elaboration with our internal model to calculate the required deceleration in order to break and bring in all these extra things. Let's look at the alternative view. So the alternative view, of course, is from the ecological approach. And the idea here is what we're going to call information-based control. So in information-based control, the first assumption we're going to make is that we're not seeing the world like a physicist, right? We're not, when we control our actions, we don't need the variables from physics. We're not computing distances, speeds, sizes, 3D layouts. What we just need is task relevant, e egocentric from our viewpoint information. We do not need a top-down representation of the world or a 3D representation of the world. We just need some information source relative to us that can help us achieve our goal. And in the ecological approach, it is believed the fundamental assumption, the root of the tree, is that perception provides this to us because there's specifying information sources in the world 
out there in our environment, there is information that gives us everything we need to control our action without further elaboration. So all we need to do in order to achieve our goal is couple in some way, link or couple our movement to that information. We don't need to process it. We don't need to calculate, predict, bring in memories, figure out whether it's a child or an adult, et cetera, and so on, right? It's much more straightforward process. So let's understand what is actually going on like in this specific example. And to do that, I actually wanna start with a different one, right? So I wanna talk with the example of catching a ball and talk about the distinction between what we looked at before, non-specifying information and specifying information, right? So a specifying information source is an information source that directly specifies an action relevant variable without the need for any further elaboration or processing, okay? So let's look at a specific example. Imagine you're a first baseman in baseball, you're waiting to catch a ball that thro is thrown towards you, right? So your goal here is catching the ball. You need to close your glove at the right time so that you close it around the ball and you don't drop it. The action relevant variable, what do you need to know? You need to know the time to contact, right? You need to know how long do I have before that ball is going to arrive, right? That is information I'm gonna need to close my glove, right? So I'm gonna somehow link my closing of my glove to the time left before it closes. And in the most famous kind of example of a specifying information source, uh, you know, this Gibson has some as well, but one of the ones most people refer to in this example was, was is usually attributed to David Lee uh, in his 1990, 1976 paper is the famous tau. Right? So time to collision is in this uh, situation is equal to the angular size theta divided by the rate at which the angular size is changing, theta, what we call theta dot. So a variable with a dot over it means rate of change, right? So time to collision or tau equals tau equals theta over theta dot, right? So this tau's information source is perfectly specifying for what we wanna do. It tells us everything we need to know. We need to know. All we need to know is how much time we have before the ball gets there, so we know when to close our glove. Tau tells us everything we need to know. We don't need to process it. We don't need to compute anything. It's specifying. It tells us our action relevant variable. A little bit more about specification. First of all, you might say, well, mate, Rob, isn't that ambiguous too, right? What if there's a different ball? What if there's a different object coming at you? Don't you need to know that kind of stuff too? What if it's going at a different speed? No, the whole point of specification is none of that matters. None of that stuff matters. And if you don't believe me, with the, the classic example I can point you to is tau, the information source I just described, was not actually first documented by David Lee in his paper. That was the first academic journal paper, but the first discussion of it was actually a footnote in a novel uh, by a novelist called Fred Hoyle. So he wrote a book called The Black Cloud, which is very similar in the story to movies like Armageddon, where you have an asteroid or an unknown object approaching Earth, and the scientists are trying to figure out what to do. And what Hoyle did, and it was actually a little footnote in the bottom of a chapter, was about the scientists figuring out how, much, how can we figure out how much time we have left, right? So in this case, they have no idea what the object was. It could have been a million miles across, or 10 miles across, or two inches wide. They don't know. Right? It's a big foreign object. But what he figured out is if you use tau, he didn't call it that, but the angular size of the object divided by the rate at which its size is changing tells you how long you have it left without ever knowing what it is, how far away it is, how fast it's moving. None of that is relevant to the controlling the action. The tau information source is specifying, it gives you the time you need. So that's one fundamental. Specifying information sources are not ambiguous. By definition, they're specifying. They give you everything you need to know. Specifying information sources in almost every case will be what we call higher order information sources. So it's just like in math, right? Higher order. So uh, angular size is a lower order variable, right? The, the tau, which uses angular size in it, 
is a higher order variable because it's combining information sources. So higher order information sources are one that combine lower level things. And that's sometimes why it's difficult for people to learn to detect these, pick, pick them up because they're more complex variables. The key point though, I wanna emphasize here is just because it's a higher order variable does not mean that what's happening is your brain is detecting the lower order ones and computing the higher order ones. So we're not proposing here that your brain pulls in angular size, does differentiation in calculus, divides it, and then gets tau, right? We pick up tau directly. We don't need to compute it. It's directly available in the information source. And there's a bunch of information that uh, papers and I things I could point you to, to that show kind of this idea that it's picked up directly, it's not computed. So that's the basic story. That's a basic example of an information source of tau. And before, you know, if you have, you, you're thinking to yourself, but what maybe this situation, Rob, what, what that applies, um, one of the things I'll point out and, and gets me a little frustrated about the ecological approach is um, there's been a lot of work on tau, right? There's been a lot of work. I did my PhD dissertation trying to challenge a bunch of the ideas of tau, right, in 1998. So before you you know, maybe go off and think, oh, there's, this is wrong. Have a look at the literature if you want to know more about the ideas of Tao and some of the challenges to it. It's been challenged for decades, right? So have a look at those. But that's the basic idea of specification, right? The specifying information directly tells us what we need for our goal. So let's go back to our driving example, braking to avoid a collision. So now we're, we're driving the car towards the stop sign, Remember, we're not worried about distance and velocity and speed. That's for a physics class, not for controlling action. Our goal is to stop comfortably before hitting the stop sign. So we want to stop close to the stop sign. We don't want to stop way before it. We don't want to hit it. So what we need to know is our action relevant variable is the required deceleration rate. What rate? What, how do we need to slow the car down so we'll stop at the stop sign? And in his paper, the same one he talks about, Tao, David Lee does a wonderful job of working out this variable called tau dot. So tau dot, so tau is the rate of the angular size of an object divided by its rate of change of angular size. Tau dot is the rate of change of, of tau. So I always say this, it might confuse people, but if you think about it, angular size is related to distance. The rate of change of angular size is related to speed. Okay, so if you put those together, we get the time. If we take the derivative of that, we get essentially acceleration information. So what David Lee wonderfully showed in his paper is that if you move so as to keep the value of tau dot, the rate of change of tau, which is all specified from information in the visual scene, you don't need to compute it. If you keep a value of minus 0.5, you will stop exactly at the stop sign without hitting it or stopping too soon. And I've done things when I teach about this, I, I've given a bunch of examples and you can make yourself an Excel spreadsheet to demonstrate this. Here's just a couple of examples that I've made. So here is a bunch of numbers. So we have um, a, a car, say starting 30 meter, 300 meters away from a target. It's decelerating in this case, one meter per second. What you can see in the tau column, it's starting 10 seconds away from hitting the stop sign. It goes all the way down to negative, right? Negative tau means you've, you've passed it. You could see tau dot in this example, I've calculated it, the rate of change of tau is above, is, is a little above minus 0.5. So it's minus 0.6, minus 0.7, minus 0.8. What you can see in this example, when tau gets to zero, I'm actually uh, still, uh, I'm past, I'm not, I've passed the stop sign when tau gets to zero, right? So I've hit it. So this is an example of collision. So if I keep, if I move so as to keep tau dot in this range, I'm gonna hit something, right? And you might wanna do that when tackling, right? So an important point that this tau dot strategy is not just for breaking, right? You can use it for other things. Um, John Juan has a wonderful paper I could point you to where he talks about using it for kissing, right? Kissing, you wanna cause a collision with the perfect amount of force. So that this is causing a collision. Right, this is another example. If you keep tau within the range of zero to minus tau dot within the range of minus zero to minus 0.5, in this case, I'm showing the deceleration rate of 1.5 meters per second squared. 
what you can see is I've stopped. So the distance has gone down. The tau has gone to uh, infinity, which means I'm not going to hit the object, but I'm still 15 meters away from the sign, right? So I've stopped way too soon. So if you want to stop way before an object, you can keep uh, the value in this range. But the main point is, if I want to stop exactly at the stop sign, all I have to do is regulate my movement to keep tau dot, the specifying information source, with a value of minus 0.5. And that's what David Lee works out. I don't need to calculate distance, speed. I don't even know, need to know what the object is. Right? All I need to do is pick up this information source and control my movement according to it. So now control, the control becomes picking up the specifying information, tau dot, putting it into my control law, which I'll talk about in a second, and then continuously regulating my deceleration. Right? So I'm not just putting in a motor program to put my foot down. I'm going to continuously adjust the pedal force as based on the value of tau dot. If it moves away from minus 0.5, I'm going to either add some more force or take some more force away. And sometimes people say that, you know, in these kind of control laws we do in ecological approach, it's just kind of a black box. You know, there's no details to it. Um, yeah, there is. Uh, here's an example of what goes into kind of this control law. So I'm taking in my tau dot value. Um, the way that we control for control deceleration, of course, in driving a car is we put force on the pedal, right? The force, the force we put on the pedal is going to change the pedal's position, right? The relationship between the position and the deceleration of a car is based on its dynamics, right? And it varies from car to car, right? Probably everyone's experienced the thing where you get a rental car and its brakes are much looser or tighter and you step on them and you either stop really suddenly or not <laughs> quite as fast as you want. Right. And these go into the, So we have these dynamics that we have to learn and go into our control law. As we break, we create information, perception, action, coupling, Gibson's loop. Right. And it's going back into the command input. So this is an example as compared to the other model I put forth. This is an example of direct perception. We're picking up tau dot inf specifying information. We don't need to do anything else to it. We don't. These aren't computations. Right. These are. These are descriptions of how we're using that information and linking it to our movements. And it's online control. It's continuous in control, continuously adjusting the pedal, right, to keep this law true. And as I said, you, you, we take into account the dynamics of the, the controller, right? So there's a, a lot more that goes into these control laws. I try to simplify them, but there's a lot more that goes into them than simply coupling, couple your movement to the information. Right, there's there's detail in there that we can test and evaluate and develop. So that's the basic idea of information-based control. Picking up the specifying information source, some variable in the environment that tells us what we need to control our action and coupling our movement to it. If that's the case, then a big question a lot of people ask is how do we learn? How do we learn to get better at that? Or how do we improve? Well, in the ecological approach, and I'm going to get to, into this more in, in future videos, I just want to kind of briefly cover this today. We learn basically by three mechanisms, three different ways, right? We learn by changing the information source we're attuned to. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. We, we might start out, we don't change from information processing internal model to, to online control. That's not what we're proposing is happening. What we propose is you might start off using a non-specifying information source to control your behavior, right? And that's that's not going to work. Um, you think it will, but it's not. And then you change as you practice. We're going to change our control laws, right? We're going to establish more effective ones um, based on using maybe incorporating more degrees of freedom and coordination. And thirdly, we're going to calibrate our control law. So in, in that, for example, in that braking example, we had the plant dynamics of the dynamics of the car. Right, we're going to learn though and cal adjust it based on the dynamics within the car and our own action capacities. And this all comes in with uh, in a uh, thing a theory called direct learning proposed by Jacobs and Michaels, which I talked about back in episode fifty three. If you look, if you're interested, but let's look at an example in the case of braking to avoid a collision. This is some really nice work by. Uh, Brett Fagen and, and some of his colleagues, he's done a whole series of studies on, on breaking to avoid a collision and understanding this. What Brett did in this study was to look at what he did was breaking in a, in a driving simulation. And what he did was vary the size of the stop sign, right? So as you're approaching 
the, the, the stop sign existence. Sometimes it was a normal sub stop sign. Sometimes it was really small. Sometimes it was even smaller. The reason he did this is that because it affects the different information sources and the relation and how it's the specification, right? So if you are, are using, in this case, we're talking about when you start breaking. So we're talking about tau. Right? So if you're using tau, theta over theta dot, the rate of change of an object to the rate of shine. If I change the object size, right, it should not affect. So this is the size of the stop sign, its radius. It should not affect you at all, right? As I said in my example, whether it's Hoyle's cloud of gas approaching Earth, or it's a baseball, or it's a football, or it's a beach ball, it doesn't matter, right? Tau is resilient to that. It's not ambiguous. It's specifying. So if I change the size of the stop sign, it shouldn't matter to you at all. But if I'm using something else, like just the rate of change of the size or this, just the angular size of the stop sign, if I'm using a non-specifying information source to control my action, it will matter. What will happen is I will break sooner when the stop sign is made bigger. So it's going to kind of affect my behavior. So this is the kind of the situation that Brett uh, created. And what he found interestingly, and this has been shown with a bunch of other tasks, for example, uh, Smith and John Flack have a really nice paper looking at this in ball catching, is that early in learning, so here's the same figure now, really plotting the, the ideal acceleration and the radius of the stop sign, but now these are actual data from people. This is from one person. So early in learning, right, the dotted line is showing what you predict if the person is using just the angular size to stop. And that looks like exactly what they were doing. The, the black dots are what they did. So early in learning, they were using uh, a, the wrong information source. Basically, the information source they were using, angular size, was not effective for the task. It's going to make you stop too early when the stop sign's big and too late when the stop sign's small. But after just 10 blocks of trials, well, you can see you get what's shown with these squares. Now they're behaving like they're using the higher order specifying information source, tau, right? So later in learning, they've shift, they've caused a change in the information source they're using to control their action. And that is one of the fundamental ways you can learn in the ecological approach. Educate your attention to a new information source. Use a new information source to control your actions. And critically, this it brings in a thing that a lot of people ask me about and a lot of people have a hard time getting their head around is how is memory involved, right? And in the ecological approach, what we argue and what is believed is that what you get from experience, what you learn is what we, the term we use is a mere change, right? Rather than adding to. So the traditional view of how, what happens when you learn something is that you accumulate, right? You accumulate knowledge, you accumulate memories, you, you, you develop all this stuff in your head. In the ecological approach, that's not what we think is happening, right? What we think is happening is you're just changing your relationship with the environment. You're changing the variables you're using. You're changing the control laws you use. You're changing the calibration between the information and the movement, right? So all you're doing is essentially a tuning using a different relationship, different tuning, different links between information and memory. You're not storing something, right? So this is an example of how your behavior can be affected by your experience without any memory in the traditional sense, right? So you, we're just changing our relationship where we're interacting in the environment. We're remembering something, right? We're remembering our control law, but we're not, it's not involving memory in the traditional sense of knowledge, of a mental model, of, of you know, it's remembering scenarios. We're just remembering how we relate to the environment so we can act on it in terms of how we link the information and our movements, right? So this is the idea of direct learning, that learning is just a change. It's just a mere change in the way we relate to our environment instead of this some complex buildup of knowledge in addition to information. So the last thing I want to mention is, of course, the million dollar question, how do we help learning? If we believe this is the way that learning happens, how do we promote it in the in direct learning and the ecological approach? Well, there's many different ways and, you know, the constraints led approach, differential learning, all those things. But one key thing we can pick up from Brett's study, the Fajian study, breaking study, is one of the key things we need there in, to help learning is variability, right? Again, this uh, we, 
beating a dead horse here, but variability is key. If Brett had not varied the size of the stop signs in his simulation, there would have been no real reason for people to switch to using a different information source, right? If you create a narrow situation where people are stopping in the same situation every time, you create what's called, Bill Warren's called a, a visual motor mapping. You created a, a narrow situation where an actually a non-specifying information source can be sufficient for controlling an action, right? So the example that I always give is baseball batting, right? If you're hitting off a pitching machine, in order to time your swing in any situation in a real game when pitch speeds are varying different pitch types, you need to use tau. But if you're going to hit off a pitching machine that always is set at the same, it's the same distance away, it's set at the same velocity, right? You can hit the ball by just using its angular size. You can time your swing. All you have to do is wait till it gets to a certain size that's perfectly correlated with its time, time to contact because of this narrow situations you've created. So you can you'll latch on to this non what's really non-specifying information in the broader sense. So variability, adding variability is key to pushing people to educating their attention to different information sources. It's critical and recalibrating and coming up with new control laws. Okay, so that's it for this uh, short video on this video on information and learning. As I said, I'll keep uh, adding to this, but I just wanted to get the basic idea of cross. And as I, as I said last time, if this is the first video you found me, you can find all the information here. And I talk a lot about more about this on the Perception in Action podcast. Thank you and cheers for now.